Would you please stand with me as we sing? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, the forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Please be seated. We are here today to celebrate the life and to mourn the passing of our beloved brother, Edward. Edward William Fudge fell asleep in Jesus Christ on November 25th 2017 at the age of 73, dressed in the righteousness of Christ by grace through faith. He was born on July 13, 1944 in a country clinic in Leicester, Alabama to Benjamin Benny Lee Fudge and Sybil Short Fudge. His mother was born and raised in Africa as the daughter of missionaries. His father was a gospel preacher and a Christian publisher. Edward was born six weeks premature and at first could not take nourishment. God spared his life in answer to his parents' prayers and had his merciful hand on him for the rest of his life. His greatest earthly treasure was his wonderful family. He is survived by Sarah Fay Lock Fudge, wife of 50 years, and his greatest encourager and critic. His daughter, Melanie Ann Simpson, and husband Michael of Katy, Texas. Melanie was just leading our singing. Son Jeremy Locke Fudge and wife Christy of Dallas, Texas. Six grandchildren, Julia Taylor Simpson and Ezekiel Locke Simpson of Katy, and Brenna Hollis Fudge, Addison Bell Fudge, Callie Marie Fudge, and Delaney Michelle Fudge of Dallas. By his mother, Sybil Fudge DeWurst, of Alabama, 
his brothers, Henry and wife Joanne from Alabama, Robert and wife Diane, also from Alabama, Benjamin and wife Susan from California, and Paul and wife Melanie from Florida, by his sister Nancy and her husband Raymond from Alabama, and a host of other relatives and friends. Some were gathered here with us today, some will be gathering in Houston on Saturday. Himself a sinner saved by grace, Edward's life ambition was to serve God and to bring glory to Jesus Christ. He started preaching in 1960 as a junior in high school and preached and taught the Bible for the rest of his life. Edward graduated from Athens Bible School, Florida College, and Abilene Christian University where he earned two degrees in biblical languages. He attended Covenant Theological Seminary and Eden Theological Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. By God's enabling, he taught and preached in Christian churches across the denominational spectrum and lectured in Christian seminaries and universities in the U.S., Canada, and New Zealand. For 21 years, he produced an internationally distributed email devotional called Grace Email. He wrote numerous Christian books and published articles in Christianity Today and other popular and scholarly journals. Edwards' church family since 1982 was the Bering Drive Church of Christ in Houston where he served as a Bible teacher and for 18 years as an elder, as my elder for part of that time. With that congregation's moral support and encouragement, he then ministered across the Christian church. In the providence of God, Edward earned a law degree from the University of Houston in 1988, and for the next 29 years, he practiced law with Jenkins and Gilchrist, Simmons and Fletcher, and the Lanier Law Firm. Special thanks to Angel, Kine, Vanessa, Yemi, Nola, and especially Daniel for their loving and diligent care over this last year. In lieu of flowers, Edward would have appreciated donations to Lifeline Chaplaincy, but equally so, Edward would have been pleased if you helped a missionary, or fed the poor, or cared for the hurting, for that was his heart. In God's own time, Edward will be resurrected, and with all the saved, in a glorified immortal body, to live forever in the new heavens and new earth. All glory to God. Come, Lord Jesus. I've been privileged to count Edward as a friend, a brother in Christ, a teacher, and a fellow pastor. Like many others, I'm deeply indebted to Edward for opening my eyes on what the scripture teaches about final punishment and God's gift of immortality. But more importantly, for teaching me to better understand and defend the character of our God who abounds in steadfast love and mercy. After re reading Edward's work and hearing him lecture, uh, I had the privilege of becoming a minister in the church where he served as an elder, and he moved from being a scholar and teacher to me to becoming a shepherd and a co-worker and a friend. I came to love Edward and Sarah Fay, Melanie and Jeremy and the whole family. It was one of the greatest honors of my ministry to be part of honoring Edward at a conference in Houston uh, three years ago that was dedicated to his work and then to be part of a subsequent collection of essays published in his honor. And I told a story in that essay of a woman in the church in Nashville that I went to serve when I left Houston. Jan came and was coming with her boyfriend, fiance really, she heard some of the things I was preaching and was intrigued by them and came to meet me in my office. She was pretty sure that the conversation wasn't going to go anywhere based on other conversations she'd had with ministers. But she had two primary objections to the Christian faith. One of them happened to be that she could not imagine a God who would torment people forever. And she was not prepared to believe in such a God. We sat and talked for about an hour and a half in my office as I shared with her the things I had learned from my good friend. When she left an hour and a half later, Jan said, you haven't said anything I thought you were going to say. 
not long after I baptized Jan. Then I uh, performed her wedding. And not long after, she lost her battle with cancer. The only person uh, in my ministry who I ever baptized, married, and buried. But in large part, because of the ministry of Edward, Jan now rests as Edward does in the peace of Christ with the hope of the resurrection at the last day with all of those who have loved his appearing. Edward cannot know the lives that he has touched both directly and those of us who knew him and loved him but countless others who've been touched by what he wrote and by those who learned from what he wrote. When I last, I told you I wouldn't get through this without choking up a little bit. When I last saw Edward in his home last year, he was as kind and gracious as ever. It was difficult to see him struggling with the increasing effects of his deteriorating health. I did not know it would be the last time I would see him, but I sensed it could be. And Judy and I discussed that in the car as we drove away. But I knew that when the end would come, Edward would be at peace. For he lived his life in the assurance of the promise of rest in Christ and the hope of the resurrection. He was ready. He was ready a year ago. He was ready 10 years ago. He has been ready his whole life. Edward is now free from the struggles he experienced in this body. He awaits the day when he will be clothed with the immortality that Christ gives and will give it his return. And so in Edward's final days, the family says he prayed again and again, come Lord Jesus. And today we join him in that prayer. He asked today that there be no sermon only some of his favorite scriptures and remembrances from family. And so today we will hear from some of his brothers, from his nephew, from his son Jeremy. Before they begin to come and share with us, Melanie's going to come and lead us in the song, Blessed Be Your Name. Please stand with me as we sing. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on a road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Choose to 
discloses it, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Please be seated. Mother said that when they brought me uh, home from that same Dr. Jackson's clinic, and they had a little bassinet fixed for me, and uh, Mom and Daddy told Edward to be careful with your tiny bitty baby brother. So for weeks, I was tiny bitty baby brother. And then uh, after I got several weeks old, they taught him to say Henry. So I've always been his tiny bitty baby brother, and I always loved him and I always looked up to him, and that has never changed. Uh, Mother told me another story that uh, was kind of interesting. When Edward started preaching as a high school boy, he was preaching at Shoal Creek Church of Christ, out the other side of Rogers, uh, out from Rogersville there. And uh, it'd been, uh, he, he was too young to drive, so Mother had to take him. And uh, they were on the way home after about the sixth trip out there, and Edward got kind of quiet, and Mother said, uh, what's, what's the matter? He said, I'm going to quit preaching. She said, why? He said, it doesn't do any good. I've been telling them the same thing now for six weeks. And ain't not, I can't tell it's making a bit of difference. I may as well just quit. So I'm glad he didn't quit, aren't y'all? Uh, that's, that's the frustration <laughs> of knowing what these folks ought to know and they're not paying attention to me. Uh, well, that's life, isn't it? Uh, when he finished his first book, he wrote in the front of it, to my brother who'd rather play ball than read, from his brother who'd rather read than play ball. And that's, uh, I, I told him in a letter I wrote him a couple of weeks ago that, you know, God had put in our hearts already what our ministries were going to be. He was a man of books, and I'm a man of ball. <laughs> still, still doing that, and he's still doing that to the death, and I hope the Lord will allow me to do what I'm doing until he's through with me. Uh, we're so proud and thankful that he's no longer suffering. It's just, uh, it's amazing. Uh, the only way he was going to get better was to get out of that old body. And it, it's, that's gone now. So we're looking forward to being with him again pretty soon. That pretty soon can happen so quickly, can't it? Uh, we just, uh, with each of us, we're going to close our eyes and then that'll be the last time. Uh, then when we hear that trumpet, we'll wake up and look around and there's Jesus. That was Gabriel's trumpet waking us up. Praise the Lord. I was asked to read uh, one of Edward's passages that he loved from Psalm chapter 27, verse 4 beginning. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me also. And answer me. When thou sayest, Seeketh, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face from me. Put not thine servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. I'm Robert, and I had the misfortune of being the middle child. 
I followed Edward, and I never could even come close scholastically. I followed Henry, and I couldn't catch him in sports, so I just gave up on both and had fun. <laughs> I took a Bible test. Many of you are familiar with Brother A.J. Rollins, who taught our Bible class our senior year at Athens Bible School, and I took a test one day, and sometime after class was over, Brother Rollins came to me, and he says, Robert, and he was almost in tears. If you know him, that was not unusual. And he said, he said, Robert, I just can't take this test paper from you. He said, I had Edward and I had Henry, and they both did so well. He said, I know you can do better. <laughs> So he gave me the test back. I took it again and made him happy and did okay on it. <laughs> Edward was the person that I measured people's intelligence by. Uh, and I didn't really realize that until not too long ago. And, and it dawned on me one day that I'd meet somebody that was pretty smart, and I'd say, you know, they're pretty smart, but they're not as smart as Edward. <laughs> I met somebody that's really smart, and I said, he's almost as smart as Edward. <laughs> But Edward came by it honestly. I, uh, our mother uh, went to Abilene also, and she took what was at that time pretty much just a men's course. So she majored in Bible, and she finished in the top of her class. Uh, Daddy uh, majored, as was already pointed out, in Bible languages uh, with a minor in biology and graduated with honors at the top of his class. And so. Uh, Edward and Henry got all the smarts, <laughs> but but it's so so thankful to to have a brother like Edward. And uh, immediately after I got word of uh, his passing Saturday morning, I, I sat down and wrote uh, a little note about Edward and sent it to the family. And one of the comments that I made in it is Edward wrote a lot of books. He wrote a lot of articles, uh, some that really changed a lot of lives. But in, in my estimation, the most important book that he ever wrote was the little bitty booklet he wrote on the grace of God. That book opened my eyes in so many ways. And many times Edward and I did not agree and he would always grin and say, well, one of these days you'll rise up and you'll understand. <laughs> But he was, he was always my big brother, and, and we'll love him and appreciate so much and just so thankful that he devoted his life to the Lord and, and serving the Lord. I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escapes the notice of God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength, they will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Edward had a faith that made him stand against the greatest opposition. But Edward came by that honestly as well. Our daddy wrote a book. Uh, entitled, Can a Christian Kill for His Government? And my daddy did not believe that a Christian could kill another one even during time of war. And he wrote that book in the middle of World War II. Uh, he faced a lot of opposition for it, but he stood for what he believed. And that's the kind of family we grew up in. And so when Edward faced opposition, when Edward faced even persecution, he stood for what he believed. And he stood firmly, not trusting in himself, but trusting in God, the God to whom we give glory today.
let's stand together. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns, oh music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal to bring and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways. From pole to pole that wars may cease, absorbed in prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end, and round his said feet, fair flowers of paradise extend, their fragrance ever sweet. Crown him the Lord of heaven, one with the Father known, and the blessed Spirit through him give from yonder Please be seated. <coughs> Second Corinthians, Chapter Five. Verse 18, Paul said, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him to, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When I looked at the beginning of verse 18, there's just a, well, in this, there's a lot of things in these verses. But I have five minutes, so we're not going to look at all of these things. But at the beginning of verse 18, he says, all this is from God. And you have to just stop and say, all this what? So I started looking back. To what's included in the all this? And it goes back at least to chapter 3, where Paul has started talking about ministry, this ministry that he has. And he describes the ministry and, and talks about this ministry. He says it's a ministry that brings righteousness. The old, the old ministry through Moses couldn't do that, but the ministry through Jesus brings righteousness. And he says it's a ministry that brings freedom. It's a ministry where we who participate, we who are recipients of this good news are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus, he says at the end of chapter 3. 
And in chapter 4, he goes on to say that for some reason, God entrusted this ministry into jars of clay, into just broken pots. And that would, of course, be all of us. I know Edward felt that way as well. Then Paul goes on to say, but I believe it. I absolutely believe it. And so I know that the one who God raised from the dead, Jesus, who he raised from the dead, because he'd raised him from the dead, he will also raise us from the dead. Paul, and that's kind of the heart of this whole ministry. The word ministry is kind of an unfortunate word, I think. We don't do ministry, except it, it kind of has religious connotations. Minister, as you know, is the same as the word servant. So Paul is talking about his service. He's talking about the job he was given to do. God's given us a job. He's entrusted us with, with a task. And Paul's task and Edward's task was to be a servant of reconciliation, as he said over in chapter 5. Then Paul goes on in chapter 5 to say, we're just clay pots. We know that God is going to raise us from the dead just like he raised Jesus from the dead. But these bodies, they just they get old, they get weary, they get tired, they wear out. They're wasting away, he said. And yet, even though my body's wasting away inwardly, it's being renewed day by day. Because someday, while there's trouble on this world, someday... Is glory. And the, the, the troubles we're going through here, he says, are working a weight, an eternal weight of glory that's waiting for us. We have a building, he says, that's from God, not made with hands, and someday the mortal will be swallowed up by life. And he says, in all this, God has done this. It's all from God. He reconciled us to himself through Jesus. And he came a bit through the great exchange that he ends with in verse 21. He made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we are the righteousness of God. Edward's life was pretty much described right there, wasn't it? He lived that ministry, and his life was devoted to, to the proclaiming of that ministry, just as Paul's was. And in that hope, he died. And in that hope, we know that we will see him again. Is Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, then draw, or let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Uncle Edward was a consummate uncle. He was funny. He was quirky. He loved dessert. <laughs> and, and he was brilliant in ways that amazed me. One of my, my earliest, one of my fondest memories uh, uh, from very early on, maybe 25 years ago, I was 9 or 10. Uh, I was sitting in our living room reading a book, which is what I do. I, I, sit and say, I do that now. That's all I do. Uh, but I, I, so I'm sitting and I'm reading and my dad and Uncle Edward walk in and Uncle Edward says, hey, what are you reading? And I said, I'm reading a Hardy Boys. And he says, well, which one? And I told him the title and he said, well, is that the one where, where Frank and Joe and they, there's such and such thing and they have to go and do such and such place and catch these such and such criminals who did the such and such blah, blah, blah. And he went on and he told me, and of course it was exactly right. I mean, that's, this is, he knew it. It had been 40 years since he looked at the book, but he knew what book it was. I was 
<laughs> yeah, and that's who, he, that's who he was, right? His bow tie was always a hit, as were the many times that we sat and we listened to his jokes and his puns, uh, and again, his love of desserts. Uh, it seems like an, uh, an evening with Uncle Edward was incomplete uh, if there wasn't a request for dessert, whether that be cake or pie or ice cream. Uncle Edward was also an unreplaceable role model. He filled a large space in my life, as I'm sure he did for many of you. And I didn't realize how large it was until he was gone. He was a strength and he was a comfort to others just by being who he was. Uh, and he's a man, he was the man that I strive to be. He thought and he wrote well about the church and about theology. And his testimony has spurred me to do the same. He pastored and he preached. And his life has shown me a path that I can walk. Sorry, I can't see. Uh, he loved Jesus and he loved people. And this love, this gentle, strong, and confident love has been an example that in my best times I've tried to emulate. He was a pillar and a gentle giant of the faith who held his ground when he knew he was right, but did so with gentleness and respect, so that even those who rejected his conclusions could not help but know that he loved Jesus uh, and call him the brother. And Uncle Edward was a friend, and he was an encourager of souls. He spoke with me as I know he spoke with all of you, out of a genuine love for who you are and a knowledge that he could learn something about God and the world through you. He listened well, he encouraged well, and he laughed well. Some years ago, uh, he let me know that I could stop calling him Uncle Edward, uh, and that I could just call him Edward. Though I rejected this offer, they'd be like calling my dad Benjamin. Hey, Benjamin, right? Like, like, though, so though I rejected it, uh, this meant a lot to me. Uh, in, my, in my mind, this meant that I was no longer just, just that little nephew, right? But he knew, that he knew me, that he loved me, that he recognized me as a friend, uh, and in some ways as an equal, as, as crazy as that sounds. Thinking back to Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, and that last verse where it says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. I cannot help but think of Uncle Edward. Uncle Edward had confidence in Christ that flowed out of his very being. His faith was deep, and it was wide, and so very obvious. He had an assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. He knew Christ, and he wanted others to know Christ. And as I think of my uncle, of what he meant to so many of us, how he blessed the lives of those around him, how he encouraged others, and how he challenged us to follow Christ well, the thought I can't let go of... Uh, is that Uncle, Uncle Edward knew God to be faithful. And he wanted everyone around him to know that God is faithful. And God is faithful. And I believe that uh, Uncle Edward, were he here with us today, would want to encourage us to remember that, that no matter what happens, no matter the tragedy, no matter the hurt, no matter the pain, God is good and God is faithful. And I miss my Uncle Edward. Stand together and sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. 
in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand. Amen. Let's be seated. This morning I mentioned to my nephew that I was going to be officiating at the service for Edward Fudge and he said, he's the one in that movie, Fudge and Mr. Hell, isn't he? And, uh, <laughs> so I got that switched around for him, but uh, uh, our, the person coming to share from uh, First Peter, uh, one of Edward's favorite passages, is a longtime friend who was associated with the production of uh, Hell and Mr. Fudge, and uh, we're going to hear now from Pat. I'm honored to be considered part of Edward's family here. Thank you. First Peter 3, one of his favorite passages. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Amen. Thank you. I'd like to tell you about my pop. He was so nice and funny. He would put a smile on my face all the time. 
He would never lie. He he would be the best pop ever, and he was so good. He was he's with the angels now, with God and Jesus. Pop would look up to God and always pray. Pop would never give up. The life was hard. His heart was a bowl of joy for me. Pop would help others and have good friendship. He. <laughs> he loved everybody. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Brenna Fudge, um, and Pop a Red Word. He was my grandpa. Um, I have a verse I want to share with you all. Um, Psalms thirty-four, eighteen says, "The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit." Hi, my name is Addison Bell Fudge, and I'm Pop's granddaughter. Edward Bowe's dad, Papa Pop. He was remembered greatly by those names and many others. For as long as I can remember, he's been known by Pop to me. One of my favorite memories I have of Pop is that whether we were at a family reunion or just at their house, he would get everyone together to pray and share a word from the Bible with all of us. John 14 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And I will go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and will take you to myself, for that where I am you may also be. And you know the way to where I am to where I'm going. We shall remember these words to help remind us that Pop is in heaven now and will be watching over each and every one of us. While we all wish he was back with us, we know that he is now healthy, happy, healthy, and pain-free in heaven. I'm asking myself, why, Pop? The answer is simple. God has a plan for all of us. The memory of the last prayer he said to me was the day of Thanksgiving, and the last time I saw him was the Friday after Thanksgiving. The 11 years he's been a part of my life have been so special and I will cherish them forever. I will always remember the way he would call me Addie Bell, and I'll cling to all the love he gave to us. I love you, Pop, and you will be remembered forever. Those are some tough acts to follow, and that's a tough act to follow. Um, several years ago, Dad wrote both his obituary that you heard and his memorial service today. And in his notes, he wrote that he didn't expect any of our family to speak today because if he was in the same position, he wouldn't be able to speak either. Anyone that spent any time from him with him knows he often cried happy tears as he called them and I inherited that from him in almost the same measure. Listen to him talk about his happy tears with his interview with Eric Metaxas just a little while ago. About that controversial subject, uh, the doctrine of hell, I have the joy of speaking with Edward Fudge who has written numerous books uh, on the subject. Mr. Fudge, once again, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, sir. It's great to be with you. Yeah, I have to. I have to ask you, uh, you. You told me off the uh, off the air that you have uh, Parkinson's, and, and then I asked you about your voice changes sometimes. It sounds like you're you're getting weepy, and you said that's exactly correct when you're talking about eternity. Uh, sometimes you get choked up. Yes, that's true. When I'm teaching in a church or seminary or lecture, sometimes I tell people at the beginning I may cry. And if I do, don't tell you anything about it. These are happy tears. But uh, every, when, I, when I speak of the Lord Jesus and his sacrifice and his redemption, I cannot help but, but sometimes have a few tears. I have to tell you, I, I wish, uh, that I pray that, uh, that the Lord would give me that, uh, that same gift. And they're happy tears because listen to how happy he was Thank right you. after. Here's Dad and the radio thing just ended. He, he gave me the whole time, just him and me. He's already about converted himself by studying. And he, it was just wonderful. Couldn't have been any better. Mom was thrilled to death with it. And I think the Lord really blessed me. And he, he asked me all the right questions to let me say what I wanted to say. And he just was good. Couldn't have been any better. He was very exuberant in his enthusiasm about the subject and about me as a presenting it and what I had to say. It just couldn't have been any better at all. And I wanted to let you know. Love you, thank you the best, praying for you, hope all is going well. And talk to you later, bye. So I figure whether happy tears or sad tears, I would do my best and you can endure my getting choked up like you did his. And while I didn't want a sermon, I, I can't talk about him without referencing scripture. So I will, and I think he would say that's cool. 
And I don't think my words can do justice to the unique essence of dad, so I'm going to let him speak for himself at times, which I would think would have tickled him. You know he likes seeing in movies about himself. <laughs> here's, here's how I think he would have started today's service. Thank you for coming today. If I'd gotten here and nobody showed up, it was going to be very embarrassing. <laughs> it would be impossible to stand up here and in a matter of a few minutes tell you all the stories and memories I have of Dad and recap all of the conversations, experiences, moments, and even unspoken looks we share with each other. I started to think through my life and all the stories I could share and finally gave up. It's like trying to count the stars in the sky. Suffice to say, the Lord abundantly blessed me and Melanie with a loving, fun, compassionate, faithful, Christ-centered dad that poured his life into ministry and into his family. I haven't had other dads to compare, of course, but in taking stock of others I've met, I honestly can't imagine having had a better dad. Without a doubt, we were all so fortunate to have had the dad we had, the husband we had, the son or brother we had, the friend we had, the mentor and role model we had, and the biblical Google incarnate that we had. <laughs> and that's just my own 42 years with him. Some had less, some had more, 50 plus in mom's case, 73 in his mom's case, and all others in between. I've heard stories about dad this week that I didn't even know about. Collectively, all of our experience and memories of him weave together a tapestry of his impact that could seemingly cover the earth. But no matter when your path and life intersected with, his, intersected with his, the themes of all the stories about him are the same. His love for God, his steadfast faith in him no matter what may come, his dedication to the message of God's undeserved kindness to sinners, and his hope for Resurrection Day, all manifested through his love of the Bible, his love of his family, and his love of others. My mind this week went to Matthew 22. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In years past, those verses seemed somehow overly simplistic to me. How can 66 books of the Bible all boil down to that, Jesus? But those verses jumped off the page this week in considering Dad's life and the legacy he leaves, for that's what Dad did. He loved God with all his heart and soul and mind. He was driven by his passion to, quote, live in his service to God's glory and the benefit of many people, as he wrote me once. Even when he was working other jobs as his occupation, his vocation was always his written and speaking ministry and seeking out the Lord's will for his next opportunity to be of service and to give him glory. Listen to how he explains one such time while in the middle of his occupational work. I, th I think a couple of things probably, Mark. First of all, it was an unbroken succession of interest in Hebrews those 35 years. I preached on it, taught on it, read it, loved it, studied it. It just, uh, it's just probably my favorite book in the whole Bible. So it was, there was never a break in a sense, but what really triggered this uh, commentary was uh, two years ago uh, in 2007 at our Lanier Law Firm retreat in Guatemala, I was out walking one morning about 6 o'clock down the cobblestone streets of Antigua, and nobody was up yet much, and I was praying, and particularly I was praying, asking God for a project that He wanted me to do next to serve Him. Uh, Next couple of hours, uh, or three hours, at least by noon, I was very impressed in my mind and heart that this is what I should do, revise that Hebrews commentary. Praying for a project that he wanted me to do to serve him next. Oh, that we would all emulate Dad. He lived Paul's words, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He lived 73 years as God's ambassador and packed it as full as he could to glorify God. He truly meant it when he prayed, Thy will be done. Even his massive work on hell was ultimately motivated by his love of the Father, as he says here. Why does it matter? Three reasons. Because we say we're speaking for God. We need to be careful we say what God says. Second, because there have been atheists and many people turned away from the gospel because of the traditional doctrine of hell. It's an impediment to evangelism. Third and most important, the character of God is at stake. If you had a babysitter who told your children, if you don't obey me, I'm going to tell your parents, and when they get home, they're going to drive nails through your feet, cut off your ears with wire pliers, and put you in the microwave till you pop, what would you think of that babysitter? Not much. What do you think God thinks about it when people say that the God who gave His Son to save people from their sin is going to put them in a place where He keeps them alive forever, just to torment them and never let them die. 
That's not the God of the Bible. That's, that's not the Father of Jesus Christ. That's not the God we worship. We serve the living and true God who gives eternal life through His Son. All thanks and praise to Him. Amen. And He loved and cared for His neighbor in both big and little ways. His family first, and then the, I'm sure, thousands that crossed His path in His 73 years. Melanie and I were molded by our observing his passion for quietly helping others, supporting missionaries around the world, praying with people, counseling his Grace Mail subscribers, and maximizing his God-ordained interactions with strangers on airplanes and in car rides who were in need of encouragement or wisdom. He always stuck up for the underdog, the less fortunate, the struggling, the downtrodden, the ragamuffins. Praying for them, sometimes specifically, many times generically, was a hallmark of any prayer that I ever heard him pray. What I marvel at perhaps most is how God had near perfectly balanced all these attributes in him. Some men are brilliant Bible scholars, but come across as arrogant or aloof or preachy. Dad was neither, as he zigzagged through the Bible, tying together one scripture after another from memory to tell the story of God's redemptive work in such a simple way that even a child could understand it, and with grace and gentleness, even if others held differing views. Some men are focused on their careers or ministries and detached from their families, but Dad poured out his love to us, constantly affirming, encouraging, and supporting us in our own journeys through life. Some men are dreamers and eschew hard work to support their families. Dad worked his tail off his whole life to provide for us, but still loved nature and all of God's creation and their creations like peanut butter pie or any pie. Some men are serious all the time, but Dad, while serious when necessary, loved having fun and being funny, telling corny jokes and puns, goofing around, playing Rummy Cuber card games, or reciting Thanatopsis with a coffee cup on his head. Hey. Can you recite something while you're doing it? To him who in the love of nature holds communion with her visible forms, she speaks with various <laughs> language, for his gayer hours, has a voice of gladness and a smile, and the eloquence of beauty that glides into his musing and steals away their sharpness. There he is aware the thoughts of the last bitter hour come like a blight over the spirit, Thoughts of the stern agony in the shroud and the pall, pall breathless darkness in the de death house, make thee shudder and grow sick at heart. Go forth under the open sky and list of nature's teaching while we're all around, earth and their waters, and the depths of it, uh, still air, come a quiet voice. Yet a few days, and thee, the all beholding sun, shall see no more. <laughs> <laughs> I actually trimmed that. He did the whole rest of it. And some men, when faced with sickness, disease, or adversity, lose faith or become bitter at God. But Dad faced his challenges with grace and humor. Uh, some people look at the glass and say it's half empty. Some people look at the glass and say it's half full. If I said the glass was half empty, I would say I've had four surgeries in the last 10 years uh, for sinuses, spine problems, and skin cancer, atrial fibrillation, a tiny stroke, Parkinson's, asthma, and six bulging discs. But that would not be the way to look at it. So I'll say the glass. Who's is, keeping count? The glass is half full, and I would say I'm glad to report that other than my brain, my heart, my lungs, my skin, and my spine, I'm in perfect health. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't remember if I mentioned Parkinson's a while ago. Yeah, that's why my legs are shaking, and anything else that shakes along the way. <laughs> I'm not scared or timid. I'm used to speaking in public. Uh, there are advantages to Parkinson's. Uh, I'm the only one in the family who can bounce our grandchildren on my knee without doing anything. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm trying out a Parkinson's diet. You eat what you can get in your mouth. <laughs> Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I'll try to emulate Dad, as he's the closest picture of Jesus I've ever known. Not because of his spiritual achievements or because he was somehow righteous on his own, but because he loved God, humbly walking with him daily through highs and lows, good and bad, times of struggle and times of refreshment. He lapped up Jesus' love like Delaney runs to my arms. And he boldly walked in faith and confidence of who he was, why he was here, and where he was going. He considered himself just one of many imperfect humans for God to use for his own glory. It seemed to me from my perspective and vantage point, that for the first 25 years, nobody mentioned it. <laughs> but then in the last five or 10 years, it's really become much more mentioned. And, uh, and to me, it all just shows that God uses uh, anybody he wants to, whether they're obscure or not, to do what he wants them to do in his power. And, 
and strength, and he gets the praise, and his work gets done as he sees fit. Mm -hmm. And then Jeremiah, at the end of Paul's discussion, he quotes Jeremiah's verse, which says, let the one who glories, glory in the Lord. And that's what we do, and that's what we can do, and are privileged to do, because Paul says in the very last verse of 1 Corinthians 1, for God has made Jesus to be for us our righteousness and wisdom and sanctification and redemption. So let the one who glories, glory in the Lord. We don't need to be proud of anything else because <laughs> nothing else is worth being proud of. And Paul says that for himself in Philippians chapter 3 when he gives his own credentials. And it's an impressive list. No Jew could do better. And then he comes to the end of that and says, but what I counted is in the prophet column, I put in the lost column, it's all just trash to be thrown out. Jesus is all that matters anymore. And that's what we want to say. That's what we want to sing. That's what's true of us. And it's good that we understand it and live by it. And God is glorified and we are blessed. And we have his fellowship and companionship all the days of our life. And then he takes us to be with him forever. And that's enough to be said. So I'll stop. Amen. Amen. Dad, you fought the good fight. You finished the race. You kept the faith. Now rest peacefully like a child sleeping in his parents' lap, as you would say. To awaken to your Savior's open arms and your crown of righteousness. Amen and amen. Dad might have wanted to have the last word today, so I'm going to let him have it. And he's going to lead us into our final song. The video's not so great on this, but the words are so, so powerful. It's our benediction as we go, and we'll go into the final song from this. That will never happen to anybody who comes to Jesus Christ as priest. He's priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, based on the character of life that he has. And because he lives forever, he saves forever. And so we're saved by Jesus, and we're perfected forever, and those who are sanctified. We're perfected forever because we are given to God on the basis of the perfect obedience of Jesus. If, if it depended on our human record, if it was up to our faithfulness to determine whether we were saved or not, then it would be a matter of every day God having to re-examine the record and several times through the day say, well, you're okay right now. Oops, sorry, you just slipped. Well, now you're back in. Oops, you're out again. Today is a good day. Tomorrow could be better, but it could be worse. There's no certainty. There's no assurance. There's not much hope. And the sad thing is that a lot of people who think they're Christians and who think they're following Jesus Christ and who think they've learned the gospel live that kind of life of uncertainty. And so they say, well, at age 85, after a very long Christian life and a life full of good works, they come to their deathbed and say, well, I hope I've done enough that I might squeeze in and be saved. Folks, we don't squeeze in. Jude says God will give you an abundant interest because it doesn't depend on our little lives. If it depended on our ability and our record and our history, we wouldn't even squeeze in. God would just say there's not even a close call, scram, other place with you. But we come, we come with an abundant interest because we come on the basis of the name and the righteousness and the blood of Jesus Christ. And he did it right. And he did it perfectly and because he did it perfectly. He only needed to do it one time. And God raised him from the dead and he is made priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God is pleased with his life, he's pleased with his priesthood, he's pleased with his intercession, he's pleased therefore with his people. And Jesus lives forever and he saves forever and he intercedes forever and we can come to him forever. There's no reason for any of God's people ever to fall away. There's no reason for any of God's people ever to drop out. There's no reason for God's people ever to get discouraged and quit. There's no reason for God's people ever to think they've been overwhelmed, overcome, or outdone. Because Jesus came as a human being and a human body, did the will of God perfectly every day of his life, defeated the devil, conquered death, brought in life, brought in the one sacrifice for sin that takes care of it forever and always and every part of its effects, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, and he says, I'm here, I'm one of you. We have a priest at the right hand of God who is one of us, who's done it right, who's done it perfectly, who lives forever, who saves forever. And God says, come up and see me any time you want to. <laughs> Call on me when you need something. Because I'm here for you and my son is here and he's one of you. He's your brother. He's been where you've been. 
He's lived your life. He's suffered your suffering. He's been tempted with your temptations. He's died your death. He's been judged your judgment. And it's all straight between me and him. And if you come in his name, you can come right in without even knocking. So that's the kind of priest we have. That's the kind of Savior we have. That's the kind of salvation we have. And he says, I'm here for you. I've done it. I've taken care of it. I've conquered the enemy. I've made interest to God. I've opened the door to heaven. I've paved the way to heaven. The path is clear. The Father is waiting. The priest is on your side. Draw near to him. And I stand here before you today not as somebody who's done all that right, but as somebody who's learned by being a flop, by being given great privilege of sinning many times nevertheless, by coming short of the glory of God, and the hope that I have is not a hope of knowing Greek. It's not a hope of going to school 20-something years. It's not a hope of even having godly parents. It's not a hope of being a righteous man. It's a hope of Jesus Christ, for my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is shifting sand. And we can all say the same thing who know and trust in Him. What more can we say except hallelujah, praise the Lord. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood support me. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then Dressed in his righteousness alone, fall blessed to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Please be seated. Well, Edward's the only preacher I've ever known who preached his own funeral. <laughs> I had another thought I was going to share with you, but I'd like to let Edward have the last word today. So I want to close with just scripture and prayer from 1 Thessalonians. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have fallen asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. 
And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let's pray. Father, we are here today to entrust to your grace and to your divine will our loved one, Edward Fudge. Receive him into your eternal care. Grant him peace and joy and rest until the day our Lord returns. We are grieving today and bring to you the burden of our sorrow for a loved one has passed from this life, a father and grandfather, brother and friend, and we grieve the loss. A beloved husband of many years, a mentor, a teacher, a fellow journeyman in this life, and we grieve the loss. We do not yet know how we will fill the void in our hearts and lives, and so we pray this day for your comfort and strength to follow in the days ahead. Give us again the joy of life and faith in you. But even in this hour of grief, Father, we are grateful, and we rejoice, and we bring to you our thanksgiving. We are grateful for the many years of love and shared life. We are grateful for the countless memories. We are grateful for the friends who've come to share our sorrow. We are grateful for the impact of Edward's life, his teaching, his writing, and especially his example. We are even grateful, Father, for the way he left this life, resting peacefully with his family gathered around him, for death does not always come so painlessly. But more than anything, Father, we are grateful for the hope we have in Jesus Christ, the hope of the resurrection, the hope of eternal life, the hope of a home you have prepared for us. We're grateful for the hope which Edward believed and which he preached. Bless us all, Father, who are gathered here in this hour of loss, God of hope, Fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may abound in hope. In the name of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, we ask this prayer. Amen.